Well, hey there everyone. Uh, as you can tell, we are not in the sanctuary in this video. We are in my office, surrounded by uh, some random books and maybe a little bit of coffee. Uh, the reason we are here is because this last week we did not have our regular worship service. And so what I thought I'd do is give you a little bit of thoughts um, that were contained within the sermon. I won't give you the whole load of hay, uh, so to speak, but I uh, wanted to give you a little bit to chew on, to think about uh, this week in the absence of, of a sermon. So we will get ready uh, and get ready and going by reading the scripture to begin with. And yes, I need some coffee because theology and coffee goes well together, right? <laughs> I want to begin with Matthew chapter 6, uh, verses 1 to 17. Beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them. For then you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So whenever you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be praised by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your alms may be done in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But whenever you pray... Go into your room and shut the door, and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. When you are praying, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then in this way, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we have also forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us into the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And whenever you fast, do not look dismal like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces so as to show others that they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that your fasting may be seen not by others, but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. So, so in this scripture, there's a couple of interesting things that are worth looking at. Uh, the first one is probably the most obvious and the most familiar to us, which is the Lord's Prayer. Now, the thing that's really interesting to me about the Lord's Prayer is that, well, millions of people have memorized this prayer. It's a very central thing to, to Christians all the world over. But uh, what's strange about that is that I'm not totally sure that Je Jesus ever really intended for us to memorize the prayer. In some ways, Jesus is teaching his disciples to pray, but he's also giving them a model of what kinds of things to pray for, not just limiting them to these specific set, uh, this specific set of words. Now, when we look at the Lord's Prayer as a model for how we can pray, we can see some pretty interesting things. The first of which is that there are six things that are asked for in this prayer. There are six petitions to God. What's interesting is that the first half of them have nothing to do with the person praying the prayer. The first things, three things that are asked are that God's name would be made holy, that God's kingdom is made a reality in this world, and that God's will or God's desires be done in this world uh, just as it is in heaven. The first half of this prayer is really about the person praying it focusing on God and asking for God's will to be done in this world, not really what the person praying it wants to be done, which I think is an interesting model for us as we pray today. I mean, maybe it's important to think about, well, when we pray, that the first first things that we do and the most uh, and the things that we spend the most time doing, that those are all focusing on God and, and looking for how God is working in our life and 
in the lives of uh, people around us and in our world today. Now, when the prayer moves on to, to the things that uh, the prayer is asking for, again, we see some really interesting and striking things. The first of which is that it asks for our daily bread to be given, which is this uh, euphemism for, for our needs. Not our wants, but the things that we need to survive, our, our basic needs. Then it goes on to asking for God's forgiveness, which is um, somewhat obvious uh, of a thing to ask for, but the really interesting twist on that is that that we ask for God's forgiveness, and at the same time we acknowledge that receiving forgiveness from God is somehow tied to the forgiveness that we give to others. It's a little unclear on exactly that relationship, um, but it, but it's a very clear connection between our own actions and um, the forgiveness that we uh, ask for and that we hope for from God. Finally, there is this petition to, uh, to be kept out of uh, evil, to not be led into temptation, which I think one of the clearest or one of the, one of the better interpretations of that line is to say that um, this, is, this is asking God to help us stay away from the things that would damage our relationship with God or, or, or help lead us towards the things in life that keep our relationship with God healthy. When you look at the second half of the prayer, you see something really, really kind of interesting, um, which is that it's a fairly simple and, and very humble prayer. I mean, the, the second half is that we're asking for our needs to be met and that we, are, that we stay in right relationship with God and with, with other people. Overall, this is a very simple, simple and humble prayer. And the reason that it is simple and humble is because of how it fits into the larger point that Jesus is making. Prayer is only one of three things that Jesus is really talking about in this section of scripture. Those three things are almsgiving, or giving to the needy, and prayer, and fasting. Now, those three things were three very, very key um, acts of worship in the ancient world, and they were things that people did to show how pious they were or how devoted they were to God. <clears throat> so, th so these are pretty important things to think about. Now, when Jesus talks about these three different things, he talks about them in a pattern, and that pattern basically is this. Jesus says, don't be like the hypocrites who are doing these things to, in order to be seen by others, but instead do them in secret so that only God knows that you're doing them and so that God will reward you and, and not humanity reward you. Now, there's a lot going on in, in what Jesus says here and in this scripture. One of the more interesting things to me is the use of the word hypocrite. Now, hypocrite to us today basically means somebody who um, says one thing and then does another. But in the ancient world, the word hypocrite comes directly from the theater. A hypocrite is quite literally an actor, someone who is putting on a show for other people. They're presenting this version of themselves or this character in order to be seen by a group of people, which is really interesting because that fits what Jesus is describing and what he's critiquing almost perfectly. With each of these three things, you have people who were doing them in such a way as to be seen by other people. When people would give money, there were some of them who would uh, make sure that other people saw them and saw how much money they were giving, and and so that they would so that they would say, "Oh, look how generous that person is." Uh, other times, uh, people would go and pray on the street corners. There were these daily prayers that were sort of required by religious people. And, and so some of them would pick these street corners, these very public places, to pray these loud, eloquent prayers so that people would say, oh, yes, they're, they're so very holy and, and in tune with God. Also, when people fasted, and this by far is the, the most interesting one to me, when, when people fasted, there was this connection with fasting between, between fasting and suffering. And so people would make it look like they were really um, in pain or, or, or in, uh, in anguish or, or suffering somehow. And, and some signs of that were sackcloth and ashes and 
um, making yourself look very disheveled. Um, so people, when they were fasting, would go around and they would put dirt on their face and um, they, they made it look very obvious that they were doing something. Um, the way one translator translated is that they make their faces unrecognizable so that they will be recognized. It's, it's a very interesting thing that people would do. Now, Jesus takes this whole practice and completely flips it on its head. Jesus says, when it comes to almsgiving, Jesus says, don't let your right hand even know what your left hand is doing. You should be that secretive about your giving. When it comes to praying, he says, go into a closet where there aren't any windows where nobody can see you praying except for God and, and do your praying there. And when you fast, you know, make it look like any other day. Take a shower, you know, <laughs> put on nice clothes. Don't, don't make it look like you are suffering or that anything is out of the ordinary. See, Jesus is saying some very interesting things here about worship in particular. And what he's really saying is that worship is about what's in your heart and what you want to express to God and the, and the earnestness with which you want to express it. Jesus is saying that you can do all of the right work things, you can say all of the right words, you can put on this wonderful show for people and yet still have completely missed the entire point of worship. I mean, it's a pretty significant thing for Jesus for Jesus to say about what the, the core of worship really is. Now, when it comes to worship, today and, and and worship in the Church of the Brethren throughout history, I think we can see some interesting things. Brethren have taken this sense of what worship is to heart. I mean, they've really taken this whole idea uh, of worshiping God with your whole heart and not letting anything get in the way of that. They've taken that very, very seriously throughout the years. Early on, they were willing to strip away anything and everything that even appeared to get in the way of worshiping God from, from our whole heart. This is why they rejected uh, fancy prayers and they rejected uh, creeds and other things like that and that were more part of a liturgical tradition. They, they took the, the command to worship in a closet very seriously, and so they, they didn't ever meet in, in church buildings. In fact, for the first almost 100 years of our existence as brethren, we were a house church movement. We didn't have buildings that we would think of as, as churches today. And even when we did start building um, church buildings, we didn't call them church buildings. We called them meeting houses, and they were very plain, uh, very simple buildings, very intentionally, so that they did not distract from worshiping God. When it came to the order of service, or what we actually did together, for a very long time in our history, we didn't have an order of service. There was no official brethren liturgy or anything like that. The idea was that we would let the Holy Spirit lead. And anybody and everybody in the congregation could contribute to that worship. Anybody could interpret scripture or or um, bring a word from God or, or all kinds of other things. Now, you might think, that what this meant is that these brethren wound up with very quiet, reserved services, but that's not necessarily the case. The idea was to let the Spirit lead, and sometimes the Spirit led with a lot of gusto. <laughs> there, there are some early descriptions of brethren worship from some outside critics that, that actually talk about how lively and boisterous a brethren worship service really was, particularly when it comes to the singing that they had. That, that was something that really set brethren apart. Just because we stripped away the formality of it doesn't mean that there wasn't a lot of life and energy in it. Now, when it comes to us today, and the whole question of what does it mean to worship God, and what does it mean for us to worship God, I think this scripture is a very key reminder of, of what it does mean to worship God, which is that that we need to worship God, that worshiping God is not about the type of instruments that we use, it's not the songs we sing, it's not the order of worship that we have, it's not the building that we're in. Worship is about what's in our heart, and, and whether we are expressing that um, 
fully and, and whether we are really worshiping God from our heart or whether we're just going through the motions and putting on a show in order to be seen by others. That's really what I think the message for us is today. It's this reminder uh, of the need to worship God from our heart and to not let all of the the little stuff, the, the window dressing, get in the way of worshiping God. Yeah, some of that stuff can be helpful from time to time, but it's not always, it's not really what is at the core of worshiping God. Remember that Jesus said where two or three are gathered, that his spirit is there. And maybe we can even say, you know, as you're watching this video, Jesus is here connecting us. And, and that worshiping God can even happen uh, across this medium. So as you think about your relationship with God and, and worship, what it means for you to worship God, my hope and my prayer is that you may find the Spirit of God. May you be filled with God's presence wherever you are, whatever you are doing. And particularly when you gather together with other Christians, may you truly see the presence of God among you. Amen.